Okay. So let's see. Let's start from the beginning here. Oh, integumentary system. So this is the last lecture. We should be able to get through it all in one sitting. Um, so this is PowerPoint D. So this ties everything together from PowerPoints A, B, and C. Okay, so functions of the integumentary system. Um, protection from the environment. The skin's the superficial surface of the body. Uh, there's thermal regulation. So you have sweat glands that cool the body down. Don't forget you have... Uh, layer of fat underneath it that kind of thermo you know uh, kind of insulates you there's also storage of um, energy there in the fat vitamin d synthesis happens in the skin you know when the uh, ultraviolet rays hit it and the skin also provides sensory info there's receptors located in the skin for you know touch or hot or cold or whatever all right so this slide just kind of sums everything up um we'll kind of go into the epidermis versus the dermis the two layers of the dermis there are five strata of the epidermis we'll talk about those and we'll talk about some of this you know the hair follicles and the glands and the nails all right so here's a cut of skin i have a model um that looks very similar to this and i'll have photos of that for you on the I'll try to post a review tomorrow uh, with some photos and some slides that could show up on the test that are actually, some of them are better than what we have on this PowerPoint. Um, so this is epidermis from the basement membrane up. That's divided into five strata. We'll talk about those in a little bit. From here to here, this is the dermis. And it's composed of two layers, the papillary layer and the reticular layer. Papillary layer is mostly areolar tissue. It's a little bit looser because look at all these capillaries and vessels up here. So this epidermis that's above this, it you know, those cells need to get some nourishment and, you know, oxygen. They need to pass their waste products back across. Uh, so you don't want real thick connective tissue right underneath your epidermis so it's going to be a little bit loose remember areola a lot of that is there uh, as you go deeper down you get into what they call the reticular layer it's a lot more dense and so that could have dense irregular it can have reticular tissue in there um, so anyway that's uh, I'll show you a close-up of that later hopefully here's a hair follicle right there's a sebaceous gland that's emptying onto the hair follicle. There's a little smooth muscle erector pili. Um, they spelled it A-R-R-E-C-T-O-R. -R -E I've seen it A-E-R-R-E-C-T-O-R. -R -E I've seen it just plain old E-R-R-E-R. -R -E -R. I've seen it spelled many different ways. So, eh, I generally spell it E-R-R-E-C-T-O-R, -R -E but whatever. Um, Here's an eccrine gland. That's a sweat gland. It uses a uh, marocrine mode of secretion. It's not showing an apocrine sweat gland on here. They're generally a little lower, a little bit bigger around. Um, there's a little corpuscle, a tactile corpuscle for light touch. That's I call them Meissner's. It's on another slide. And then this is a corpuscle uh for deeper touch you see it's located deeper down in the dermis so you have to press a little harder to activate that one and that's why your brain can differentiate a light touch from a deep touch by which receptors get activated uh i call this one a pacinian p-a-c-i-n-i-a-n um, but you can call it lamellated lamellated just means it has rings see those rings in there um all right, and the little uh, projections, see the dermis has these little nipple-like projections that go up into here, right? Sometimes my corpuscles are in there. Those are called dermal papillae, hence the name the papillary layer. Papilla just means nipple-like projection, okay? All right, let's look at the epidermis a little closer. So the epidermis, so there's a dermal papilla. Oh, and by the way, the negative of that, where this comes down, is called an epidermal ridge. Epidermal ridge uh, ridges can be responsible for your fingerprints. Um, so the dermal papilla is here. And so basically, from 
the basement membrane all the way to the top. Uh, that's your epidermis. So this is divided into five strata. So the bottom closest to the basement membrane is called the stratum germinativum. That's the old name. The new name whoop, is stratum basal. B-A-S-A-L. I often see that with an E on the end of it. That's why I call it basal. But you could say stratum basal. Um, it's attached to the basement membrane. There's stem cells in there. It could be melanocytes also for uh, producing melanin. Uh, right above that, keratinization begins. So remember, remember hair is made of keratin, but keratin is just a protein. There can be protein, you know, all within this tissue, not just hairs. Um, and so that's it. When they looked at it under the microscope years and years and years ago, it looked kind of spiny to them. So what did they name it? Stratum spinosum. You go a little further up, it looks kind of granular. Still more keratin is being added there. So that they call that the granulosum, stratum granulosum. Go up a little higher towards the surface and you get a clear layer. And it's really not even a real layer, they found out later. But they called it the stratum lucidum because it looks clear, you know, like, like lucid or, or translucent. Um, you only see that in thick skin. And so let me show you a little, this little clear area. And when they saw that, they called it a stratum lucidum, thinking it was some kind of special layer. Really, it's not. It's just when you stain really thick skin for some reason way down low like this, it doesn't pick up the stain. <laughs> so it's just an artifact of the way it's stained, but it, they call it a layer. So it's stratum lucidum. And then all above that, they call the stratum corneum. They usually draw it in yellow here, which helps me remember corn and stratum corneum. Uh, that's just the way the artists drew it, though. Um, but yeah, that's the dead stuff. So these cells are basically dead. And so if you go get dermabrasion or whatever at the spa, they get rid of a lot of this upper layer, right? And that's uh, stratum corneum. Okay. So this is thick skin. This is thin skin. Thin skin normally has hair. Probably you do here. They just, you're zoomed in so close that maybe a hair follicle's over here and you missed it, right? Uh, there are certain places on your body that have thin skin that do not have hair, like the external genitalia. But for the most part, there's, there's hair in thin skin. So, stratum corneum, you can see it's not much to the stratum corneum over here. It kind of got torn away when they made the slide. But you can see it's thin. Okay, and then there's your stratum lucidum. It looks kind of clear, and then you can kind of kind of see the granulosum and the spinosum and the germinativum or basal down here. Uh, there's an epidermal ridge versus a dermal papilla. So this is probably from your palm or your foot, right? You know that's where you can find nice thick skin. Uh, there's going to be no hair. Uh, in thick skin that's one thing one way you can tell them apart okay and then obviously this is thin skin they're still stratified squamous it's just one's called thick skin one one's called thin skin uh, here okay uh, so this is just showing you the epidermal ridges and the dermal papillas right fingerprints remember I said those can make up your fingerprints um, So, composed of connective tissue, the dermis, mainly. It's highly vascular. There's also blood vessels in there. There's nerves and receptors scattered in there. And it's deep. That's just a, oh, I forgot to give you that uh, directional term, superficial versus deep. But it's easy to figure out. So, this is located deep to the epidermis. has two layers. We talked about papillary versus reticular. So that papillary layer, that's where the blood vessels are. And, they, you know, you got to get nutrients and O2 and all of that to the uh, epidermis. So, oh, by the way, this, the closer you are to your blood supply, the better off these cells are. So they're still nice and plump and fresh. As, you, as more and more of these cells get made, they get pushed up, the other ones. 
And so the further you get to the surface, the older those cells are. And then they're, they're dying. And then so they die off. And then that becomes that cornified layer. Because you're just so darn far away from your nutrients and your blood supply. Okay. Um, the papillary versus reticular layer. So sometimes I just ask the question, what two layers compose the dermis? You go papillary, reticular. Boom, you got the, you got the points. Um, I could ask a question like, name the five strata of the epidermis going from the top to the bottom. And you go stratum corneum in, th in thick skin. Stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, strania, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, stratum germinativum or basal. Okay, so if you were poking with a needle, though, that's the order you would go through when you were giving a shot, right? And your needle has to go through there. Okay. Um, the reticular layer, interwoven network of collagen fibers surrounding dermal organs, like the sweat gland would be considered a dermal organ. A hair follicle would be considered a dermal organ. organ. So the wrinkles and stretch marks, you know, they can arise from degradation of this reticular layer, you know, as it kind of breaks down as you get older. And um, so that can uh, happen. So what are these? Lines of cleavage. We talked about this in lecture. So basically in your dermis, the elastic fibers and the collagen fibers, they tend to flow in parallel bundles uh, in there. And some of that's probably genetic. Some of it's probably gravity. Some of it's probably, you know, the way the muscles pull on your, on these um, fibers over time. It, they just tend to be in certain orientations. So if you look, here's the front half of a person, there's the back half. And you notice these bundles of um, fibers, they drew them, you know, the directions that they're running. Why is this important? Well, if you're a surgeon and you cut, you have to cut into, you know, the abdomen or whatever right here. And if you follow a line of cleavage like that, when you sew them up, it's going to heal faster and it's going to leave less of a scar. Whereas if you cut perpendicular to lines of cleavage, like if you cut them that way, then it's going to heal slower and it's going to um, leave more of a scar usually. And it really gets to be a consideration up around the face because there's all kind of patterns up there because think of all your facial muscles, smiling, frowning, you know, grimacing, whatever, um, you know, that pulls and it, it causes all kind of patterns in there. So the plastic surgeons really need to be aware of this. Okay. Um, so just remember, if I ask you this question, what are lines of cleavage? Don't say like I get every semester. Lines in the skin. No. <laughs> it's the way the bundles of collagen and elastic fibers and stuff like that tend to be arranged in parallel bundles in the skin or maybe be a little more specific say in the dermis okay um and that if you cut parallel to the line of cleavage it will generally heal faster whereas if you cut perpendicular or across it it generally heals slower and leaves more of a scar than if you cut with them uh, all right um by the way just for your own info Let's find that cut. About a few years ago, three years ago, four years ago, I can't remember. Um, used to, they would go, the skin is composed of three layers. They would go epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. Right? In your eighth edition and ninth edition of your book, they kind of changed that. They're saying skin is only epidermis and dermis now. They're calling the hypodermis like a separate layer. So they're, they're not saying that's part of the skin anymore. But I'm still kind of old school. If I ask you a question like, name the three big layers of the skin. Just go epidermis, uh, dermis, hypodermis. Right? If I say, what are the two subdivisions of the dermis? Then you would go papillary reticulum. What are the five strata of the epidermis? Then you can give me those strata. Strata. Strata is plural. Stratum. Is singular 
hypodermis. You may have also called that, heard that called a subcutaneous layer because you can give somebody a subcutaneous injection. You've heard of that versus an intramuscular injection where, you know, those needles have to go deeper. Okay. Um, all right. Got all that. The hypodermis, it's loose connective tissue with adipose cells and fat, right? And so there's areolar mixed in with that a lot, usually. And there's a region, regional distribution of fat. Um, it's probably hormonally controlled, so it kind of tends to go different areas in, a, in a males versus females. Um, what does it do? It stabilizes the position of the organs, you know. Uh, it reduces heat loss, obviously. It's an energy reserve and it's a cushion, right? So, just, you know, sometimes I'll ask a question like that. Um, accessory structures of the integument. So, skin, hair, and nails, right? And then is what the integument is, but there's glands, right? So, the hair grows pretty much everywhere except areas with thick skin, like the palms and the ventral surfaces of the uh, fingers, and then uh, the bottoms of the feet, right? That's thick skin, right? So no hair there. Hair is formed in organs called hair follicles. Hair gives extra added sensory info and protects the orifices of the body, like it can grow in the nostrils and the ears, okay? Three types of hair. So sometimes I do ask this now because some of you some of you guys end up going into uh, uh, dermatology, right? And so vellus hairs are peach fuzz. So like on the, uh, say on your forearm, on the ventral surface, right? You'll go, oh, there's no hair there. But if you look real close, there's a little peach fuzz, right? Um, and so that's called vellus hairs. Intermediate hairs are stimulated by hormones, right? Uh, pubic hair, beard, distal appendages, and then terminal hairs, like on your head, your eyebrows, your eyelashes, are called terminal hairs. So you see, I could do a magic article. Vellus hairs, intermediate hairs, terminal hairs. And over on the other column, I could go, I could go stimulated by hormones, peach fuzz, eyebrows, something like that. And you would have to match them up. Uh, I don't really have, technically anything with a box around it is supposed to be fair game on a on a test or a quiz or a test. Um, but that's just so you'll know, that's the glassy membrane right there. They call it this is a hair follicle cut across and it's got the hair shaft in the middle of it. There's an external root sheath and an internal root sheath. And then in here is your keratin, which is the actual hair you have hard and soft. Um, I don't really have a good slide like this. It's kind of cool when you do have slides cut across like that because. A lot of times you get you a sebaceous gland in the cut, and, you, and of course the hair is gone out of this. It didn't fell out in the uh, uh, when they made the slide, um, but you can see how this sebaceous gland, holocron modus secretion, remember, um, empties onto that hair shaft. So here you can see the way the artists do here. So if you cut it across like that, you would get this effect. Okay. Uh, that's an oily secretion because remember everything in those cells, the entire cell, you know, goes into that secretion. So it's an exocrine mode of secretion because it's still going through a duct onto an epithelial surface. Um, but this is an oil, those are oil glands. Sebaceous glands are oil. Don't call them sweat glands. Sweat glands, that's different. So here's apocrine sweat gland. They drew a big one, and they connected that to a hair shaft, too. I think some of them can go straight up to the skin, but I think most of them end up going to, a lot of them end up going to hair shafts. Um, Maracrine, I don't call them that. I call them eccrine sweat glands. So I call them eccrine and apocrine sweat glands. Eccrine is the not smelly one. Apocrine is the smelly one. Maracrine is what they're trying to call the eccrines now. But, yeah, it's confusing because they use American mode of secretion. Well, guess what? An apocrine sweat gland uses American mode of secretion also. Okay. So that's why I stay old school. I go, we have eccrine sweat glands. Those are kind of the small ones. Not smelly. And you have apocrine sweat glands, which can be located in the groin or the, you know, uh, region or 
uh, armpit region, whatever, and they do have a little bit of smell to them. That's why they thought they used an apocrine mode of secretion, but they don't, right? Okay. Mammary glands, modified apocrine glands. So that is actually a modified apocrine sweat gland made them. That's what mammary glands are. So it's kind of weird. But just know that mammary glands are like tiferous glands. They use a marocrine mode of secretion. This should have an N in here, we found out. It should be ceruminous glands, um, like it's because the stuff is called cerumen. Okay? Modified uh, American glands that release cerumen. Guess what? I'm not going to even ask you this until we get to uh, neuro when we're discussing the ear. So don't even worry about ceruminous glands on this test. Uh, mammary glands, yeah, make sure you know those use an apocrine mode of secretion, right? And there's, there's your holocon, American, and apocrine, and which glands use what, okay? Um, nails, protect the distal ends of the fingers and toes, stratum corneum forms the hyponychium and the eponychium. And blood vessels can give them kind of a pink color. So eponychium up here by the cuticle. And then hyponychium is that little skin under there where if you ever get a splinter under there, it really hurts. But that goes through your hyponychium. Lunula is just a point name. See that little clearish looking area right there? A look on your thumb. It's really nice on most people. Right? And it's just point name. If I point at that, you go, what is that little half moon shape? Lunula, which I guess it means little moon. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, all right, so really the only thing fair game off a picture like this is eponychium, hyponychium, lunula. And, you know, there's a nail bed. So say you get your nail ripped off, but it doesn't damage this this area here where, it, you know, it'll grow back. <laughs> you know, it's going to take a while, but it will, you know, grow back as long as you don't damage, you know, the cells that are making it. So the epidermis, we did the stratum, 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 right? Stratum. Um, the dermis, we divided into papillary and reticular. The hypodermis, we looked at the uh, adipose in there, and the pacinian corpuscles can, I guess they can be down in there too. That's for deep tuck. Um, you know, if they drew this a little further down. I call it a pacinian even when it's up here. Um so I think we're cool here. Make sure you know that erector pili, pili is not under your control. That's smooth muscle. So when you get scared, your hair stands up, right? On the back of your neck or your arms. And that's not under your control. Right? It can also stand up if you're, if you're cold too, I think. Then burns. This could just be a question dealing with the layers. First degree, second degree, third degree burns. So just know that the first degree... It's not burning very deep, just bare in the epidermis and maybe just barely, barely into the papillary layer. So it's not going to affect the follicles in the glands, right? It's going to hurt. It's going to be inflamed and tender, but it's not, probably not going to scar. Um, you'll be fine. Second degree burn, that's going deeper. It's burning into the reticular layer. I go, true or false? A second degree burn burns into the reticular layer. True. Um, in the dermis, right? Uh, so that can affect hair follicles and glands. And guess what? That's going to blister. So most of us have probably experienced that at some point in your life, in, in our lives. Um, and so that it's going to be very painful blister. So like hot boiling water can give you a second degree burn, you know. Um, so it's probably not going to scar, but I guess it might could. Uh, but like I said, you generally recover pretty well from that. Third degree burn, you've burned all the way down to the hypodermis. So that's really gone deep, deeply. And so blood vessels are destroyed, accessory, sensory nerves and accessory structures, all that gets destroyed. So it's charred. Ironically, right at first, not much pain because all the receptors have been burned away. Right now, as as you're healing and repairing and they have to come in there and debris that, you know, like the nurses do, that can be very painful. And uh, we were discussing class. I think there's even a category now where they call it a, th a fourth degree burn that's actually burned to the bone. 
so that's an even worse burn okay but it's not in your not on the powerpoint so i probably won't do that unless it would be a bonus so anyway there's first degree so look up here just right at the top just burned right up there barely 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 into the papillary um first degree that's a pretty bad first degree <laughs> it looks like that's kind of uh blister to me but i could be wrong uh there's blisters that's a second degree burn you see how it went deeper right uh, didn't go into the hypodermis, but it went pretty deep, right, down into that particular layer. And then third degree went really deep, right, down into the hypodermis. So can I ask you a question about what does aging do to the integument, like an essay? Yeah. So don't just say you get wrinkles and gray hair. You know, you might get a point, <laughs> right? But you got to be a little more specific, right? Uh, so the epidermis. What, what does aging do to the integumentary system? So do it like this. Well, your epidermis gets thin, right? So because of less, you know, germinative activity, and you're, that makes you more prone to injury and infection. Don't worry about Langerhans cells and immune function. We didn't study those. Uh, here you could say the melanocytes uh, activity, melanocyte activity decreases, so it can make you more likely to sunburn ironically even though this is decreasing I don't know why but your vitamin D synthesis also goes down as you get older and you need vitamin D for proper muscle and bone you know uh, functions and, and and so you can end up with weakness in these areas uh, vitamin D is almost almost acts like a little almost like a steroid and it's really uh, helps in you know building muscle uh, or hypertrophy muscle, I guess I should say. Um, do you get less sweat and oil gland activity? Yeah, so older folks have a reduced ability to regulate their temperature and they can have drier skin. So you've got to watch them because that means they can overheat quicker, right? Um, so, like, don't leave great great grandma in the car, you know, while you run into the store because it can heat up pretty fast inside of there. Um, and they may not be able to operate the electric windows or whatever, and, you know, they can really overheat quickly in there. Um, so hair follicles, uh, at, at least roll the windows down for them, right? Um, uh, hair follicles, um, that their function can decrease, and that can cause thinner hair, balding, gray can, uh, the melanocytes are not working so good and so you know you get uh graying and you know white hairs the dermis gets thin so you can get wrinkles and sagging you know because the elastic fibers breaking down and then you can get recurring infections because the skin repairs more slowly as you age and then this is just uh showing you that cut of skin again make sure oh by the way that's a papilla they call that a papilla also at the end of the hair fall papilla is generic word just means nipple like projection see there see the papilla um and you see the way all this is made from epithelial tissue or it's derived from epithelial tissue this this uh follicle and also even the sebaceous gland right remember glands are derived from epithelial tissue it's kind of cool because it's showing you sebaceous glands that would be emptying onto a hair follicle you can't see the hair follicle that great here or onto the hair shaft you, you can see a really nice uh, papilla uh, down here. But we're zoomed fa so far out. This is thin skin, obviously, because you got hair. But you can actually see the papillary layer. It's got a weird, different color to it versus a reticular layer. This is mostly dense, irregular, and reticular. Um, and then you go down here, and it's hypodermis or fat. And that's also got areola mixed in with it, too. But look at the way an eccrine gland. These are eccrine. Apocrines would probably be lower and bigger. So this eccrine sweat gland, it looks like a bag of worms. It's, you know, it's like a garden hose that got curled up and then you cut across it uh, and you get all these little ducts. Whereas sebaceous gland, oligomotor secretion, you, it looks like a sack of cells. It almost looks like the tiles on the floor effect. Anyway, that's it. Just under 30 minutes like we thought. Okay, so I'll post this.